yes, I read uh, this chapter a couple of weeks ago and um, um, I haven't looked at it really since. Um, um, the um, so the, the the topics covered um, are um, things that like as a as a normal R programmer, I wouldn't have considered a, a particularly important route for optimizing code. Um, I guess caching, you could probably say, but it's quite. Um, but yeah, um, for um, shiny apps, these seem to be quite useful indeed. So these are so the, the chapter talks about the major routes for optimizing um, shiny code, uh, and then emphasizes two particular um, routes. One being caching, where you um, save results for subsequent use so that you don't have to recompute them and things and asynchronous code which is a way of um, um, offsetting um, the computation of something to uh, another server and leave it to run and only try and you know pull it back onto your computer when you actually need it effectively that maybe that's not the best description but that's kind of it's it's like um limiting how much uh computation you need to be done need to get done um uh at, at any given time so you can do stuff in the background or you can get stuff done by a distant server or something like that um right so i'll um Yes, so there's a few resources mentioned at the start of this chapter. Um, so Efficient R Program is a book that my boss wrote, um, which is mentioned in here, which which is really not about Shiny at all. It kind of predates Shiny, really. But um, it's about um, how to structure your R code such that it's more performant. And um, advanced star obviously this on how to um, gain performance improvements in there um, so how best to organize your code and how to vectorize things to speed things up um, those two books are about kind of standard R programming and, and efficiency and things. And, and the things that we talked about in the earlier chapters on um, um, benchmarking and profiling and things like that all kind of tie in with, with those kind of things. Um, Master in Shiny has a good chapter on performance as well. It's right at the end of the book. So I don't know whether the other um, Master in Shiny cohort have reached it yet, but um, it's uh, so it does cover things like caching and um, um, what's the other thing? Oh, yeah, and kind of scheduling tasks. So taking computation outside of your app so that it's run on a kind of schedule and you just pull in the data once it's computed uh, rather than computing that data each time your app is loaded. Um, Yes, so there's a few things. There are a couple of interesting blog posts relate, related to the caching stuff. Um, and I've highlighted these here because I don't, I don't think they're mentioned in the, in, in the book, but the, the mechanism used in Shiny for caching uh, results and, and such like changed within the past couple of years so um so there are um if you follow this hyperlink it takes you to a um a website that says please don't use this <laughs> please use a different method um but this is uh what is it render cached plot um is a method that's discussed in the book so i, I figured i ought to flag that up as well 
and there's a few different packages that are mentioned in in, in this chapter as well. Um, so um, yes, um, caching is about storing those results that are either uh, produced in a memory intensive way or a time intensive way um, such that um, if you need that result again, you can access it immediately. Um, so it might um, compute some values and then store those values in a kind of, you know, in, in some directory that you can look up at a later stage or, or something like that on, on the server that your shiny app is housed upon. Um, yeah, so you store your, your, your kind of resource intensive results so you don't have to recompute them, but storing those computed results does take up memory on the hard drive of your server or in memory if you're, you're caching them in memory or something like that. Um, so you can't cache everything that a user might, you know, every possible result that a user might uh, want. Um, the, own, the, the, the issues that you have to kind of deal with here are is um, you have to be certain that given the same inputs, uh, sorry, what kinds of things um, does it make sense to store such that you can pull them back into your app qu quickly in this sort of, with what val what type of values are, are, are worth caching, um, and ultimately, it, if if the result that you've generated would differ from one day to the next, given the same input values, then that's not something that you should be caching. Um, the the values that you compute have to be identical each time the same inputs are. Um, provided so anything that depends on like random number generation um, anything that depends on um, implicitly depends on like the current time and date or something like that aren't good choices for caching or may need to be converted such that those implicit inputs are, are, are um made more concrete um, so things that you might cache though plots and database queries um, and um, uh, th you know things like that um, where you know particularly if the database itself isn't something that's constantly being updated if it's if it's a relatively low um, uh, frequency of change in the in the database, you 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 should be okay. Um, in R, there are ways to cache results or that already exist. Um, so uh, there's this R dot cache package, which I'm I don't think they discuss in much detail here. And there's this memoize package. Um, so the, these two packages, they work in a similar way. Um, so if I pull up memo wise, um, oh. so, um, so the way this works, you, um, you have a function and you convert it into a, a cacheable function by associate by by kind of wrapping that function with this higher order function memoize. What that gives you is a function that when you call it with particular arguments, it will store the results of of of, of calling that function. Um, such that if you call it again with the same arguments, it will just immediately give you the result. Um, so we've got an example of how to do that here. 
Um, so, what what did I describe what this does? Um, so here, this is just a timing package. So this would be to uh, determine how long things take to run here, tick and then talk. Um, this is a function that will, um, it, you know, it's just a kind of teaching example. So what it will do when you call this function, it will tell R to sleep for as many seconds as you've passed in as the argument. And then it will return the current time to the, the user. So this, <laughs> so given what I said earlier on about not caching results that are subject to uh, the, you know, um, that are dependent on the state of the system. So things like the time or the day, sort of random number um, seed and things. Um, this isn't a good function to cache. It's just being used as an example. So if I call it now, it will take a second to run, then it will return the time, which in the UK is 21 minutes past five. Um, if I called it again in 10 minutes, but with the same argument seconds equals one, it would return immediate, sorry, if, if I called this function on its own, it would tell me that the time is 31 minutes past five. If I wrap it in a um, memoizing function, then I can call that with a particular argument. The first time that you call it, it will go through all this computation, which is kind of, uh, you know, just an example. So it will sleep here. If you call it for 10 seconds, it will sleep. Then it will return the current time, which is 22 minutes past five. If I then call it in five minutes time, with the same argument 10, it won't do any computation. It will reach in and pull out the result it computed earlier on, which is 22 minutes past five, although the current time is 27 minutes past five. So that's, anyway, so we'll just do an example of that. I'll just copy this code into our studio. Um, okay, then. Um, if we, so this is how you take, so that function there is a kind of a more typical R function. It just, it does something and then it returns a value. This function is a memoized version of the same. And that means that it caches whatever result it computes. Um, so if, um, if I call, oh, sorry, there was something, there was some code there. So tick <laughs> itself is probably caching something somewhere. Um, so uh, this is just the tick and talk here thing, uh, are just ways of timing how long it takes to run some code. Right. Oh, sorry, I've not pulled it in and that's ruined. Um, <laughs> well, that's ruined the example. Um, so uh, if I library. Oh, sorry. Oh, where's everything gone? <sighs> it's really, it's been one of them days. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where anything's gone here. Um, uh, what has happened to... I think you just gave focus to your viewer window. Um, I think if you go back to view, you might be able to pull up your console again. Show all panes. There. You there. Go. Okay. Install packages. Oh, jeez. Uh, 
anyway, the, um, okay, right. So if we do that example again, the problem with it is it has already, oh, gee. you know, I, I like go, I, I go to like, um, you know, meetups and kind of coding me uh you know conferences and things like that over the past few years not maybe not the past two years but like prior to that um and you know sometimes you watch people doing this live coding stuff and it seems like um they they must rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it you know because every time i do any live coding they always i always <laughs> It's always a bit of a pain. So, sorry. So, what's gone on there? I, I didn't get to show you the the original example, but what what happened originally was it took ten seconds. It went away into the background, slept for ten seconds, then it came back with the current time. Um. um then, when I called that function a second time it returned in a fraction of a second. So it definitely didn't wait the 10 seconds that the function is, you know, expected to, um, the, sorry, the uncached function would take. Um, and again, yeah, even though the current time is two minutes later than this, whenever we call that cached function with that argument, it will return the value that it computed originally. Um, so that's basically how you do caching in um, in uh, outside of Shiny. Um, the 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 same kind of processes are involved in 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 Shiny, but it um, with um, with Memoize you're doing it in in memory. It's a, if if I'm not mistake and i think that might be um but um anyway so so it's a similar process when you're doing it in, in shiny but for shiny you might have um various ways that the user can select um types of plots and arguments for uh data analyses and things like that for each collection of those inputs, you know, in any given plot or table or whatever within your app that's presented to the user may depend on a, a, a collection of those different inputs that the, the, the user might select. Um, if it's something that takes a long time to, to compute, then it's something that you might want to consider um, caching either the very final figure or the table from which the um figure is produced and you know so again um there are there are, there are things to 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 think about even when you're caching things because if you've got say you're presenting a table and a figure in in your app and they both depend on the same data set and they both use the same maybe they filter out a particular what we're using here diamonds so maybe they filter out a particular class of diamonds from that large diamonds data set and then present a table for, of it and a, a figure of it do you cache both the table and the figure um for 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 presentation or do you cache a kind of intermediate table from which those two presented um artifacts are, uh, are produced and um certainly in in that kind of relatively simple example it makes sense to cache the intermediate uh table because it's used for multiple different things that are presented to the user but um anyway so this is an example um so oh have i have i over 
stuff to this. Um, let's. Um, if I library shiny light has connection. Right. Just while you're rendering that, uh, caching by definition is non-persistent, correct? So, like, oh yeah, it I'm, can get overwritten and things. Yeah. Well, what what I'm thinking is like, if you have a web page that you are generating, and the first time that your computer accesses that server, it's going to incur the cost of. Uh, uh, generating or producing the document object model is going to render all the data from the server. Once mm. the cached media comes in, now the time associated with updating that uh, website, your, your computer already has this cached memory concept, right? Uh, or the server itself is going to be able to, to send it a lot faster. It's already rendered most of the me media um, initially. I always thought cached memory was a non-persistent way of optimizing exchange between client server handshake. So the, the, the server, if you're caching that memory, mm -hmm. like let's say knitter, for example, yeah. so you're going to, you're going to knit your, your markdown document to an output form. Um, nothing in that is going to change. You've already got the cache memory of all your text. That's going to be static. It's not going to change. Uh, maybe your images, for example, maybe won't change, but there's a table, maybe a plot that does get updated the next time you knit something together. Uh, the database or the data that you're collecting has changed, and so therefore it has to re-render that output. Memwise and the, and the whole caching mechanism is going to optimize the static material first and only spend computing resources on the table itself. It doesn't have to wait, or sorry, it doesn't have to uh, generate excessive amounts of energy to, to output, you know, the, the static material that's already cached, that's already just, you know, out there. We're only going to be computing the, the table itself. Am I making sense in, in the thought mm -hmm. process of how caching operates? Yeah, yeah. Um... I think though uh, um, the 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 mechanisms described for caching in Shiny seem to be a solely a kind of server side thing. Um, I think it's more about ensuring that the um, the server isn't computing the same thing over and over again and less about making the transfer from the server to the client as efficient as possible. Or, or, or maybe I've misunderstood. Um, but yeah, it certainly um, seems to be more about um, preventing all, too much computation rather than um, trying to um store you know i don't know what you'd say uh yeah i i i i i, I take your point yeah um but i don't i don't know the answer <laughs> so um anyway so this uh, i'll just give a, another kind of more practical example because um so this is we've got a user interface um and within this uh the user can select um a subset of the diamonds data set um, this this function here, I've overstuffed a little bit. So what it will do is it will return a server function where there's a database connection associated with that server function. Um, and we can create a connection to a, an in-memory database here, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to write the uh, diamonds data set to an in-memory database a number of times. And then we're going to create a, a, a Shiny app to 
look at subsets of that data set. Um, now, the only thing that we haven't defined here is this, which is a memoized way of um, making a SQL query against that in-memory database. Um, I'll just get the code for doing that. Um, so yeah, I mean, other than that function, that looks like a fairly standard bit of shiny code. Um, if we take a function, um, and what it does is it selects based on a particular cut. So the user selects a particular type of diamond. Based on that, Shiny will make a query against this database and only pull out um, data relevant to that subset of the, that particular subtype of diamond. Um, but that would be relatively slow. Uh, if you had to do that over and over again and you wanted to pull out the same cut mul multiple times, it might be worth just pulling out the data for a particular cut once and then access it through a kind of cached storage whenever you need it. Um, so this is admittedly, the, the database, it's got, you know, half a million rows, but, but it's still relatively small compared with some, you know, of the, the data sets that are used in, in practice. Um, so what we'll do is we'll copy this over as well. Um, so that's a function, right, um, for doing the SQL query. So, boom, boom. Um, so you can see what it's doing. It will print stuff to the console as well, and then it will go into this database. Um, let's see, cash equals cash time, right? Right. Bum, bum. The we'll define the shiny UI and a function that will create a server, and we'll create that database. So that's a connection to the database. This is. Um, adding a lot of data to that in-memory database and then we can um, call the shiny app restart it if i just lost what i was doing now. um so there are five different cuts of diamond if we click fair then maybe oh, maybe it's I don't know whether I can tell. I can't see. Um, ah, yes. So each time, uh, where's the function here? So the the SQL query function, it will print to the command. It will print print to the console every time it's called. If we um, if we call it with cut premium, then it will tell us that it's just called the database. If we call it with good, it will tell us that it's just called the database. And then if we call it with premium again, it didn't call the database that time. It just returned the values that it had stored, you know, available. The problem with this as an example is it's not a particularly slow query so it doesn't reveal the benefits that you might gain from caching but still i mean it's uh it's it it's pretty um it, it's pretty useful it, and you can certainly see that you know you're not calling the database multiple times but you might be calling to the file system multiple times to pull out your cached data, which might, whether or not doing that is as fast as it would be to get the same data from a database. Um, anyway, um, it would certainly be faster if that was a, 
connection you had to a, a, a database on a distant server um or if the the data set was huge compared um so that is how you'd use memoize for caching um of the functions that you've defined within your shiny app um there is already a way of uh, caching results within shiny um and what happens is you um you use this function bind cache which um if we go to so this is the updated shiny caching um blog post um and the recommendation now is to use this bind cache uh, function and what it will do is the way it works is in your server function you might have some code to create a plot to cre create a rendered version of a plot then that value you can pipe into bind cache which is a, a function within shiny now and um, with it you have to provide the whatever arguments are whatever arguments dictate precisely which plot is created so when is this another diamond thing no it's an m so there's three different data sets um and depending on the data set chosen a different type of plot will be produced um, um and for a given data set it will always be the same plot but that might be thousands of points printed to the you know the the it has to position and whatnot so it you can see how it may be um faster to store those results and then pull them back out from a, a cached store um so what i've done it, this example was taken from the book but i rewrote it to use bind cache rather than render cached plot which is an, an older version of the the, the shiny caching um functions so if i start another script and copy this over into there oops oh. okay so um yes so the ui is relatively simple um you have a way of selecting a particular data set from from three that are, are, are typically used in a lot of our examples then you have a server function that will create a plot based on the selected data set so we'll uh oh sorry i have to stop that um we'll run that and then we'll run that and then we can do that now that might not have been obvious so what we'll do is we'll pick empty cars that might take a i don't know half a second to do hmm. it uh, again the um I, I think it might be a um i think if i if i was running this on my eight-year-old laptop that I've got stored downstairs, that might have taken a couple of seconds to run, but um, and 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 been faster upon you know, on pulling the cached uh, figure from from the thing. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty much instantaneous when you when you select a data set the second time the plot is produced immediately whereas if you do it 
um, when you first select a given data set, it might take a split second to, to generate that plot. But maybe putting a delay in or putting some timing or something like that might, might reveal it. But it, it's the same thing as, as was in the earlier section of the, um, of, of the, um, the notes. Um, so uh, in addition, you can cache on remote storage. Um, and as we were talking about earlier on, you only have limited space. So older cached values can be can can get dropped if they're not being used, and it, it's typically a um, first in first out type. Well, you know, last used is the first out type of uh, mechanism. Now, this was a very interesting section. Um, so this is about asynchronous um programming in r well in shiny specifically um and i there are there are aspects of this that i still don't really have any clue about what's going on on the board. um so anyway one of the limitations in a way of r is that it's single threaded um so if you've got a script it will run from top to bottom and if you've got a step that takes a long time at the top, you have to wait until that's finished until you can do the next step in that script and the next step and the next step. The sequential, um, uh, com you know, these are sequential computations. Now, um, um, so this is what happens. So uh, hold on, let's say, let's say we've got, um, I should probably have drawn a picture to, to describe this. Um, so maybe you've got a few processes in your R script. Uh, B and C might depend on A. So you need to perform A before you can do either B or C. Um, and D as a process depends on the, on the results from B and the results from C. But B and C are independent of each other. So in a, a multi-threaded world, in a, a parallelized computing world, you could do A first, and then you could do B and C in parallel because they're independent of each other. And then when you've computed both B and C, you could then do D. But because ours are single-threaded, you have to do A and then either B or C, and then depending on which one you did, then do C or B and then do D. Um, so now, um, if you can offset your computing to somewhere else, or if you're downloading a lot of data from somewhere else, transferring that data to and from a distant server might take a long time. But because it, because regardless of how fast your laptop, your desktop is, you can't speed that up. Um, it might be worth your while while that co while you're waiting for results to come back to your computer from a distant server, you could be using your computer to compute some other things that are required later on in your uh, workflow. So, whereas the synchronous version, the single threaded version of the um, of a, a kind of uh, process might go, you know, you do A first, and then you do B, and then you do C, and then you do D. Um, sorry, that would be this. Um, if part of that uh, computing is done is done on a remote server say that remote server does process B, you can perform step A, send its results to the distant server, wait for the server to complete and send you back the results, and then you can do C and D on your computer. 
that's a kind of synchronous version of it. Um, so again, this is still with this setup where B and C could be independent if, if they, they, they needed to be. The asynchronous version is you do A first, then you start B, and that sends you know a message to a, a distant server. It starts running this long process B. So either on the server it's a long running process, or the you know traveling of you know the information traveling to and from that server is a long running process. While you're waiting for that, you could be running C on your computer. Now the there are two um, packages, future and promises, that um, provide the means to do this kind of asynchronous uh, code. Um, and um, yes, um, and you can incorporate them into Shiny relatively uh it, you know in the same way as you would in your r scripts so here it, there's an example here um so sorry what should i say here future the package is used for uh, from my understanding at least and i am not an expert on this kind of um Although this is this is quite common in the JavaScript world, doing this kind of asynchronous um, computing, I'm, I'm really not an expert. At it. Um, future, from my understanding, it it they, these are objects that are used to send computations elsewhere, and promises are objects that are used for handling the async for handling results that won't where there may be a lag before they are back on your computer so there's a these are used for handling the unpredictability of when the result is computed and back on your back and available to you um so they're basically um promises are like a kind of um uh, a, a kind of placeholder for a result that will eventually arrive. Um, so, um, da, 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 oh yes, so sorry, the formatting's a bit off, but um, there are a couple of um, operators provided by either future or promises, I can't remember. Um, so this is for piping the results of one um computation into another process you use this uh three dots and then a um and then a arrow um for the one of the big problems you'll have here is that if you know if part of your workflow depends on pulling data from some server if that server isn't up, you need to be able to handle possible, you know, the possible unavailability of results and, and things like that. Um, so this second operator here with the exclamation mark is there is is to handle um, is it, if an error happens, how do you handle it? uh so what this code here is doing this initial function call creates a an object um it 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 initializes the computation of some values if those values return without error and when they return without error it will print those values out, but if they return, if that computation returns with an error, the whole, what this says is that the whole process will stop. So stop is a function that, that basically stops your R session, basically. Um, so, uh, duh, 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 duh. 
So that that kind of pipes are uh, from promise uh, promises library uh, mm. package. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you can pipe, uh, but you can pipe um, one asynchronous call into another asynchronous call and into another, and um, yeah, uh, yeah. So this could pipe into another call to future and, and whatnot but uh yes um i i <laughs> i was working on an app where they used this thing a few months ago and i would never even seen that the syntax before um anyway um you learn things as you go don't you really um um yes so until like a month ago until like uh, working through this chapter, I hadn't done anything on like asynchronous computing in R. Now, so this this chapter, uh, this section of the chapter is talking about cross session issues. So this is like um, the server function will be called for each um, user that um, opens your app. So for each of their browsers, they will initialize your app on their browser and the server function associated with your app will be run for each of those th three, four, five different people. Um, what I couldn't quite work out was whether um, precisely how. Uh, so this. I mean, I, I've run the examples and it works nicely, but I don't understand how it works because if if you've got multiple users all working, oh, and each of their each of the apps that they are connected to, that's that might be four versions of the app running. So running in a single thread on your server is that not it, right no i don't think it's a single thread russ i think what okay. I, I i what i'm seeing happening with the server call or the future promise concept it's dealing with latency and you won't mm. really witness the latency unless you increase the scale of your server yeah. so the the more people the comment you made about the four or five individuals let's say it's ten thousand users yeah, all yeah. accessing that single server that's where multi-threading comes in or the ability that you're generating server calls, server processing time. When you mm. couple that to caching, if a user, let's say Frederica as an example, Frederica chooses a, a, a diamond status set, you know, as a, as a parsing process and then that output of the example we had before. So the server's already cached that. Then Russ, you go and access that same diamond data set. The server doesn't have to calculate anything because yeah, it's already yeah. stored in cache. When we talk about threading and scalability, you're increasing a promise to that user, Frederica, that accessed it. And then you come as a same exact time, the server's promising that uh, you're going to get that information, but it's gotta, it's gotta serve Frederica first. That, that's probably a bad example because that just is two individuals. But I'm looking at yeah. the concept of this scenario with asynchronous calls as a way in optimizing the capability of that server. And I don't. I, I think with our, our current environments that we work in today, latency and, and time association is not really something to even concern yourself with unless it's a really massive data set. Um, okay. Your computer is going to process it faster. If we go back, you know, 20 years from now or 20 years in the past or, you know, 30 years in the past, computing is, you know, still fairly uh, infancy. These are really big concerns of management, of, of calculating information and sending it to that user. Um, do you remember uh, a few sessions ago, I think it was three or four sessions ago, I made a comment referencing the differences between Apache web servers and Nginx web servers. Mm. In one yeah. case, Apache is extremely efficient at rendering a single path of, of information flow. What it doesn't do well with is multi-threading. If you cross over and you use Nginx, on the other hand, it's not the greatest at serving information, but it's unbelievably efficient at multi-threading. 
And so when you combine the two together in a reverse proxy concept, your Apache servers are standing behind the reverse proxy. You've got an Nginx web server that's managing your threading to those, those web servers. Um, I'll see if I can find an article in relation mm -hmm. to this sure. as a comparison, because it does really make sense on the future promise concepts of, of what this example is doing for okay. us. Okay. But, right. Um, so anyway, so this example, what I was planning on doing was to run it in two separate browser windows at the same time. So what should happen here? Um, that would mean we've got two sessions um, and if they were running in uh, it, you know if one session blocked the other it should take 40 seconds to com complete and maybe bring it down to 10 seconds actually um, um, so so now, if we've got two windows attached to the app, it should take 20 seconds if one session blocks the other. Whereas if the two sessions don't block each other, it should take 10 seconds for each of the two results to come up, right? Um, so if I do that and then I, um, hold on. I'll pull that over here and I'll, do that and then I'll get our studio back up and do S. So if I okay, get rid of that for a second. So and oh, oh that's not the thing I well that's not what I thought was gonna happen at all. Did I get any errors in there? Um, hold on, maybe I didn't copy the right code over. Sorry, um, uh, it's not quite what I thought was going to happen. That's weird. Um, right, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, th I was kind of expecting a whole new um, app to... Uh, what's going on here? Um, sorry, I'm on a different screen now. Um, right, let's have a see. So, you know I... Oh, right. Yeah, no, that hasn't worked. Um, okay, if I just... There, right. So now we've got UI. Then we've got... Server. Okay, right. I'll start that again. Okay. Um, so the... It's the same URL. So this should take 10 seconds and then the results should come up on the same, at the same sort of time. And that, I don't know, maybe that's approximately what happened. Um, it's a problem that I, you know, I'm dealing with a relatively well, I mean, I I don't have the number of cores that a typical web server would. But um, anyway, um, yes. So, but it was certainly it certainly wasn't ten seconds after the first one showed its result that the second one showed its result. So it it yeah, it certainly looks like the cross section blocking is alleviated doing that. Then there was a um, there was another. Uh, example in here of how you speed up um, asynchronous, how you use asynchronous computing to speed up um, within a given user's session. Um, so how you speed it up for a single person. Um, so this, um, 
so where I say these things block, what I mean is that um, computing this value um, blocks any further computation within a given person's session. Um, so, so this because this is the same code that was used in the previous section. Um, now, so your 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 computing a value. So this will sleep for three seconds, return some you know randomly selected values, and then assign them to this. Um, while those three seconds are um, while you're sitting around waiting for those three seconds to kind of complete, um, you could be doing something else with the um, with the app if it's an app of you know any reasonable complexity. Um, and the authors present this alternative where um, you set up a collection of reactive values and you initialize an output reactive to be null. So it's initially, it initially does have a value, even though that value is null. Um, and um, that value is used in the UI to you know, print out some randomly selected numbers. Um, when it's null, you you don't have those numbers available, so you, you can't print them. But um, so what happens here? So if this was in your server function, this would be initialized, and then this future block would be um, set off. Um, but because it isn't assigning a value directly to a variable, so there's no assignment on the left-hand side here, um, in some ways it isn't going to block um, the app for five seconds. So it'll go in here, initialize this code, and blah, 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 and then but you can carry on working and eventually the eventually the result that's computed by this will be produced and it will be it will update this value here but because you don't have that rv dollar output on the left hand side of this future the app won't it, it's not like the app will stop until those values are computed it will initialize this code to run and then what once that particular result's been created it will update the reactive value um something like that anyway um how does it work? So that updates some reactive value. And then once that's computed, you assign the, the value that took a long time to compute to the thing that's printed out. Um, I've still yet to wrap my head around precisely what's going on here, precisely why um, this doing the assignment on the inside of that future block why that makes such a difference in the you know the the behavior of the code um so that anyway. time association that five seconds of sleep time is yeah. that allowing the client server exchange to pause allowing the server to process for that five seconds of time. And if it doesn't generate within that five seconds, we print an error. So like the, the null value is just putting a placeholder saying, 
I'm going to populate this with information, but I've got to go, you know, in the warehouse and go grab something real quick. It's going to take me a little bit of time, just hang out and wait within that period. If the five seconds are elapsed, your server doesn't calculate or doesn't render an output in that period of time, you're going to get an error in that uh, placeholder of output. Um, I think what, what I'm seeing happening here is you can now fine tune your network latency and any other server, uh, uh, almost like hardware, right? So if you got really slow hardware that's calculating this, you mentioned your laptop downstairs that takes forever to, to process a couple of seconds for it. You're allowing that time to pause, let the server do its job. If it yeah. doesn't calculate in that time, present an error to the user so they know that they're at least getting a call back. Um, does that make sense? The, yeah. the the output I don't, no. I don't think that's no. what's going on. But okay. uh, yeah, I, I guess. Um, um, yeah, I, I, it just seems like um, so be, because this value has an, an initial is initially set. There isn't a kind of um, there isn't an impetus in the reactive graph underlying this app to update it. But um, as you as as the interpreter goes through the server function, it will initialize this code and initialize it to run. But because it's a because it's wrapped in a future, um, you know, higher order function, um, it doesn't need to wait for anything to be computed there so it it will initialize that and then ignore it and then go down here um this assigns whatever the value is that's stored in there to this which is then printed out by the user interface but five seconds later this thing that was kicked off may lead to that reactive value being updated and any downstream any any things that depend upon it will then need to be updated reactively so output our norm will be updated um so although this takes five seconds to run you don't have to wait five seconds to get to this point in the server function. I think that's, well, that's my understanding of this. Um, yes, so um, so that's that. There is a couple of other sections in the, in, in the chapter, relatively short ones, um, about, it's not we're checking whether the future that returns is the one that you need. Um, uh, I've, I think I've preceded a paragraph and then I can't understand what I've actually written here. Um, so if you need, um, so if, if you initialize a lot of asynchronous computations at the same time, so you set off five things to compute, unless you need, if, if you need each of those, you know, if you need them sequentially, say um, one depends on, sorry, two depends on one and three depends on two and such like. Um, there's a, the, there, are, there are ways of writing your code such that it, 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 it's more efficient. If you need all five of them, but they don't depend on each other, um, there's a way of writing your code that, that, that may be more appropriate. If you need the values to return in sequence, because, you know, process three might finish faster than process one. Um, there's a way of, you know, putting those future, uh, sorry, putting those promises into a queue object, which means that you don't use you use the values that return in the order that you actually need those values. 
that stuff was a bit too complicated and I didn't think I'd be able to explain it well here. <laughs> so I'll just point you to it for for your own interest. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it was a really interesting chapter though. Um, and and certainly the the asynchronous stuff wasn't stuff that was mentioned in Mastering Shiny. And really, like I hadn't even looked into futures and promises in R until um two or three weeks ago um but yeah it's uh it, it's quite neat but i've still there's still a i don't know i'm still having problems with the computational model of precisely what's going on and why one thing blocks but another thing doesn't but I, i'll have a good think about it i think over the, over the next few days but yeah i think the the, uh, the other comment to that or add to that russ would be the fact that a lot of the technology that shiny utilizes is outside of r so the mm. the concepts of just tcp ip networking you know latency of of communication over vast you know uh swaths of the world you know as we as we send and receive data back and forth all of that context is outside the discussion of r as a service so the the i guess the, the comment or the reason i'm saying it is a lot of the discussions that we're having here in relation to r are reliant on the world outside of our uh, the the networking calls and 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 web services etc. Yeah, yeah, it is quite interesting because I I imagine a lot of people write shiny apps and have um, very little concept of the wider web within which they're embedded and um, these certainly the this particular book club, the Mastering Shiny to a degree, um, have been quite eye-opening really for me and on, on those on that front. Um because I don't know, I mean I was pretty competent <laughs> as an R programmer to begin with, but like when you step out from that to um uh the shiny world and various other things like plumber and the Python equivalents, Flask and such like. Um, it it's a whole different it's a whole different world. And also, like you know, there's a lot of people who've done web development who are trying to get into data science. And there's a lot of data scientists who are having to learn enough web development to fix these kind of apps and to do more advanced things and stuff like that. So, the, yeah, I think there's probably a. a a, a kind of meeting point somewhere <laughs> but um yeah um yeah it was it was quite interesting so anyway um um so next week hopefully um ryan you're going to be talking about javascript to us all i am i uh so next week is the 13th isn't my saying that right what is our calendar 12th i think the 12th okay yeah, no, I should be good. Um, there is, there's a week coming up that I'm going to have to miss our daily call only because I'll be teaching a class sure, and sure. Uh, it's scheduled for the week of the 17th, but I should be good uh, for, for submitting the JavaScript. I'm really cool. excited in this next uh, chapter. I'm going to be bridging between the uh, Mastering Shiny Book Club and the Engineering Shiny Book Club. So both chapters are going to be discussing this optimization slash JavaScript uh, scenario. So I'm going to be doing them both uh, in parallel with each other. Um, I'm really excited. This is a, a, a chapter that I, I want to open up and, and learn more about, or at least share the, the learning path with everyone. Cool, cool. Right. Anyway, um, thanks for coming along. Um, I will look forward to seeing you next week then. Um, Thank cool. you. Right. Great. <laughs> I'll see you cool. all later. Bye. Good, Good luck Bye. with the new computer, Russ. Thanks, <laughs> All right. It's not worked out well <laughs> so far. Uh, see you later. Bye. Yeah. Great Bye. to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.